Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary from marysnest.com where I share traditional recipes for making nutrient dense foods using simple ingredients. And today I'd like to show you how to make bone broth, beef bone broth specifically. And I want to give you a few tips and tricks on what are the best bones to use to make a nice gelatinous bone broth. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And if you'd like learning more about traditional cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell that'll let you know each time I upload a video. Okay, let's get started. My mother always made bone broth and I grew up drinking it. And when I became a new mother, I also wanted to make bone broth for my son. I always used to make it on my stove top, but then I discovered you can make it in the slow cooker. It's much easier doing it this way. So if you have a slow cooker, be sure to pull it out and we'll get ready to make bone broth in it. Now some of the best bones you can find for making bone broth are oxtails and neck bones. Now today here on this baking sheet, I just have oxtails. I didn't have any neck bones and I had originally planned to have some beef shanks, but I ordered these bones uh, through the mail and what arrived to me was just oxtails even though I had ordered some beef shanks. Either they were out or weren't available, whatnot, and so they just substituted all oxtails, which is fine because you will find oxtails make wonderful, wonderful bone broth. And generally what I like to do is have oxtails, some neck, neck bones, and a few shanks. Now, uh, the nice thing about the beef shanks is although they don't provide a lot of gelatin, they do have some marrow in them and that'll slip out into the broth when you're slow cooking it and make the broth even more nutritious. And now another type of bone that you also want to add to your, when you're making bone broth are these marrow bones. These are wonderful and as you can see they have the marrow right in the middle there and that will do one of two things. It'll, it'll either stay in there and cook in your uh, slow cooker and then you can take it out with a knife and you can either add it into your broth or you can uh, put it on some toast. It's actually quite delicious. You sprinkle it with a little salt. It's very nice. Uh, but if it doesn't if it doesn't naturally come out and you don't want to eat it separately and you want to have it incorporated into your broth, you can just poke it out with a knife as it softens and cooks and let it um, blend in with your broth. Okay, well the first thing that we want to do is put these marrow bones into the slow cooker. And we're just going to get those in and then we're going to cover with water just enough to cover the bones because we're going to let these just sit there a little and soak. I'm going to add all those drippings that came off the bones and then I'm going to put just enough water to cover. Ah, splashing. And I'll show you this in a minute. There we go. Good. That's just covering the bones. You can see, I'm going to try and tip that a little. Alrighty, now I'm going to add, um, this is I think some marsala. Uh, you can add apple cider vinegar. Um, I generally don't do that. I find it just has a little bit of a, leaves a little bit of a strong taste in the bone broth, but that's personal preference and you really have to experiment. But the reason that you want to add some sort of acid to your bone broth when you're making it is that helps break down the gelatin and will help make your bone broth as gelatinous as possible. What I like to do is add about a cup of whatever I have on hand that's sort of in the red wine family. It can be red wine, it can be port, uh, marsala, Madeira, something like that. Okay, well I've added the Madeira into the slow cooker uh, along with the water and the marrow bones. I'm just going to let them sit there and soak a bit while I get ready to roast the oxtails. And I just want to show you, I'm going to try to tip this down and see if you can see that. The Madeira imparts a nice color uh, onto the, into the broth which makes it very, makes the final product very appetizing. And um, I wanted to mention if you do, if you do decide to use the apple cider vinegar, you may want to start with just a quarter of a cup. Uh, that's a good amount of acid to help break down the cartilage and the gelatin, collagen, so on and so forth. I used a cup of the Madeira and if whatever uh, alcohol that I use, as I mentioned with my chicken bone broth, 
I use the white vermouth and I also use a cup. The alcohol cooks off and uh, imparts a little bit of a nice flavor. Uh, with the apple cider vinegar, as I said, I would mention, a, uh, I would recommend using a quarter of a cup and see how you like the flavor. You can always add more, but a quarter of a cup should be sufficient. Well now I'm going to get ready to roast these uh, oxtails in the oven and I'm going to roast them at 350 degrees for about an hour. They'll get nice and brown and that too will impart a lovely color uh, into the bone broth as well as flavor. Now before I do that I just want to mention that I have about altogether about four pounds of bones and to that I usually use about four quarts of water and this is an eight quart slow cooker. Now if you're using a, a six quart slow cooker, just decrease everything a little bit. Have about three uh, pounds of bones and about three quarts of water and that should work beautifully and make for a nice gelatinous broth because the big thing is we want to make sure that we don't add too much water. You want to just add enough to cover which the four quarts of water along with the four pounds of bones and the aromatics that we'll talk about later that I'll be adding to the uh, slow cooker will come up right to the rim and that'll be perfect and everything will be submerged. So that's why it's nice doing it in the, uh, in the slow cooker because it really helps you to prevent from adding too much water because if you add too much water then you'll dilute the gelatin and it will become uh, watery. And it's still uh, nutritious but the, the gelatin is not as concentrated. Alrighty, well I'm gonna get these into the uh, oven. Oh, and first I wanna show you if you're not familiar with oxtails. Um, as you'll see, there's a bone right in the middle and a, it's surrounded by meat and some fat and this, these larger pieces are uh, higher up on the tail, closer to the animal's body and these bones have a little little hardness to them, although you could probably push push your fingernail into it. And as you get towards the end of the tail, they become very um, very uh, gelatinous like in nature. There's more collagen, and um, I'm going to find one here that's very soft. Yeah, this they really have a lot of give. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but they have a lot of give to them and they're going to dissolve, that's going to just dissolve beautifully and make the stock very gelatinous. And I had one in here, oh yeah, this one, it's so soft, it almost feels like butter that uh, has been out of the refrigerator for a while. And then this is very, has a lot of give to it. So that's what oxtails look like and because of this, the high amount of the cartilage in these tails is what dissolves and helps make the bone broth uh, so uh, lovely and gelatinous. Well let me get these into the oven. So as I said 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour we'll roast them and then I'll bring you back when we get ready to put them into the slow cooker. Now my timer on my oven just went off, so my bones have been roasting for an hour and they're a beautiful brown. I'm gonna take those out in a minute. And I just wanted to let you know, after 30 minutes, I opened the oven and turned all the bones over, closed them, put them back in the oven, and let them roast for the additional 30 minutes for the total of one hour. And while those were roasting, these marrow bones were soaking here in the water and the um, Madeira that I had put them in. And and why this is helpful, I'm not sure I mentioned it before. Uh, in addition to the marrow that will be released from them, also the bone itself uh, does have some collagen in it. And the uh, acid that's in the Madeira or any alcohol that you add or the apple cider vinegar will help to leach that collagen out of the bones. And also, as I had mentioned earlier, there's one more thing to help make the broth nice and gelatinous. I know a lot of people believe that the acid helps to leach out calcium and other minerals, and there is a little bit of that, but nowhere near what you would, amount of calcium you would find in dairy. So your way to make a bone broth more, gel um, not more gelatinous, but uh, higher in calcium is by adding calcium rich vegetables to your uh, bone broth. Well, I've got my bones out of the oven and they look terrific. They're nice and brown and already some of this uh, collagen here 
that makes up the tail bones is starting to, to soften. It's wonderful. So what I'm going to do is take each piece and I'm going to put it into the slow cooker. And when I get them all in, I'll show you how I'm going to also add in the drippings and deglaze the pan a bit. Well, I've added all of the bones to the, to the slow cooker over here. And now I'm going to add in all these drippings from this pan. First, what I'm going to do is take the spatula and just try to push as much of this down to the end here. So this way, when I uh, pour it into the slow cooker, it'll be a little easier to get everything in. Alrighty, here we go. I'm just going to pour this all over that. There we go, perfect. And then what I'm going to do is just scoop up some of this. Get that in there and get this little last bit in there. Okay. Then I'm going to take my water and I'm going to pour it onto this baking sheet splattering and get every little last bit of goodness that I'll add to the slow cooker. Alrighty, well I've deglazed this pan and now I'm going to pour all of this into the slow cooker. Perfect. Alrighty. Well let me set this aside and um, next thing we're going to do is put in the various aromatics. Well, I wanted to show you this container that I normally keep my veggie scraps in. What I do is, when I'm getting ready to cook, whatever I'm making, I get this out of my freezer, and I just, sorry if this sounds a little loud, but I just push the bag like this. I, I line it with a bag. I just find that uh, it helps to prevent a little bit of freezer burn. And as I'm cooking, I'll add my carrot scraps, my celery scraps, onion skins, even lettuces, um, all vegetables like that. I don't add anything in the cruciferous family like broccoli, uh, cauliflower, because that can impart a little off flavor in, into my bone broth. But your aromatics and your lettuces work very well and so I put in bone broths and so I put those in there and then what I do after I'm whatever meal I'm cooking, uh, put all my scraps in there, then I close it up and then I try to push partially close it up, then I try to push as much air as I can out of it. It's not a perfect seal, but it helps prevent some of the freezer burn. And then I just put this lid back on and then back into my freezer it goes. And I have it labeled veggie scraps for bone broths. Now there's nothing in here because I just made chicken bone broth yesterday and I used everything I had in there. But I just wanted to share that with you as a little tip uh, for when you're cooking and you have, uh, you need some sort of uh, vessel to store your um, scraps in. And this is nice, just to show it to you again, it's very narrow and it fits very easily into my freezer. And it's made by Rubbermaid and you can find these pretty much anywhere, Walmart, uh, Target. I believe I found this at my local grocery store. Now the first thing that I like to add in terms of the aromatics to my bone broth are two bay leaves and it's about a teaspoon of peppercorns. Now I don't add any salt because that I would add after the fact, once the bone broth is made, depending on what I'm using it for. I also don't add any garlic into my bone broth and I don't add any into my chicken bone broth as well because I find uh, with it simmering for a very long time, sometimes the garlic can give a little bit of an off-putting taste. Uh, but again, that's something that you need to experiment with. It's really personal preference, but it's something that I like to leave out. Next, what I like to add into my bone broth are onions, carrots, and celery. And usually what I do is I leave the skins on the onions. I don't worry about it. They impart nice color and nice flavor as well. And in terms of the carrots and the celery, I usually, I always have a lot of carrots and celery on hand. And I usually just try to find those that might be, you know, coming to a little less than their best quality. Those are the ones that are perfect for making bone broth. As you see, these are getting a little dry on the edge. I don't know if you can see. And these carrots have seen a little better days. So uh, that's what I'm gonna add into the um, slow cooker. And when I'm all done, I'll bring you back and we'll see if we need to top it off with a little bit of water. Well, I've got all my veggies in and it's all 
almost to the rim, you might be able to see. And I think it's perfect. I'm not going to add in any more water uh, because I don't want it to get too high and then bubble over a little. I've had that happen to me in the past. But how I'm going to start this is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my slow cooker all the ways to high. And I'm going to leave this on high for about an hour. Now I'm not going to simmer it on high for the entire 12 hours and the reason is once my slow cooker comes up to temp at high it's going to boil and I don't want my bone broth to boil for 12 hours and the reason is what happens is the boiling uh, and you may have heard this expression before I think I mentioned it in my chicken bone broth video that it breaks the gelatin. So you will not get a gelatinous uh, bone broth. It's still nutritious and it's still good for you, but you'll lose some of those nice gelatinous properties. And that is something that I really like having in my bone broth because it, it helps with your, with your joints, your skin, your nails, your hair, everything. The gelatin is really a wonderful feature. So what I do is now I don't turn it down to low and the reason is I have the same problem with this particular slow cooker. At low it boils, not as furiously as on high, but pretty darn close. So what I've found is after one hour, bring it up to a nice temp, if there's any um, uh, scum that has uh, floated to the top, I can remove that. At that point the vegetables will have softened a little bit. I can push them a little more uh, underneath the liquid so that they're fully submerged. And then I turn it down to keep warm. On this slow cooker, keep warm is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the perfect temperature for making bone broth. And it will allow it to uh, simmer for 12 hours at 180 degrees Fahrenheit will allow it to be beautifully gelatinous. So that's exactly what I do. So for now I'm going to turn this up to high. I'm going to cover it and when it comes up to temp I'm going to turn it right down to keep warm. And that's uh, it, probably about an hour. Well I've had this on high coming up to temp for just about an hour now and I checked it with my th uh, food thermometer and it's just about at 180, which is perfect, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I'm going to turn this down to warm. But before I do that, I just want to show you one thing that I mentioned earlier about saving scraps that go into this broth, into this bone broth. I was making um, chicken soup for dinner and I brought out, I had this out for my scraps. And as you'll see, I've got some carrot shavings, some onion peels, uh, some celery, little bits and bobs of everything. And then what I was talking about in terms of just trying to push out as much air as I can, leave it open a little like that, push it down as much as I can, get, as out, get out as much air as I can, and then close it. A little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a chore there. And then I'll put that in my freezer. In any event, getting back to the bone broth. Uh, so I'm going to turn this down to warm and I just want to show you how it looks. You'll see, I hope you can see this, you'll see that the vegetables have softened a little and have started to sink a little more under the uh, liquid. I probably really put in a little, little more vegetables than I needed but that's okay, I'm not going to worry about it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to keep this lid on, I'm going to keep it at warm and I'm going to come back in 12 hours and I'll show you how I strain it and decant it. Well it's been 12 hours now and this has been simmering on the keep warm setting so I'm going to turn it off, I'm going to remove the lid and I'm going to get ready to strain out all of the ingredients in here so we're just left with the bone broth. This is a wonderful strainer to use. I bought this at an Asian grocery store for about $3.99. So if you're out and about in your travels, definitely look for one of these. It'll make the job a lot easier. And we're just going to get all of this out and I'm going to transfer it into this bowl. Now I'm not going to discard this. I'm going to save this and I'm going to make a second batch of bone broth with this because there's still plenty of nutrition in these bones. So I'm just going to keep 
taking out all of these bones and vegetables, transferring them to this bowl, and when I'm all done with that, I'll bring you back and I'll show you what the next step will be to strain this broth to make it nice and clear so we can be ready to decant it. Now I've strained everything out of the broth, but before I put this aside, I wanted to show you something. You'll notice that this marrow bone is completely uh, see-through now because the marrow in here has come out during the um, simmering and is now uh, mixed in with the broth. This one on the other hand you can see there's a little bit of marrow still in there. Now you could, this is so soft I, I could even push it right out with my finger or you could use a knife but I'm going to push it out with my finger so that you can see exactly what it looks like. So I'm just going to push that right out and that's what the marrow in the marrow bones looks like once it's cooked. Now, that said, you can put this back into your broth, mix it in, and make the broth more nutritious, or you can save this, and as I had mentioned earlier, I believe in the beginning of the video, was you can take this and put this on toast and sprinkle it with a little sea salt. It's actually quite delicious. Now I've moved all of my vegetables and bones to the side there and I'm going to save those to do another batch of bone broth because I still think there's plenty of nutrition in there that I can extract from those bones. But before I move ahead, because I was talking about bone marrow, I wanted to share with you to show you a package of bone marrow bones that have been cut very small. I hope that you can see those. I have them in a plastic package from the store. What's nice about these bones is if initially eating the marrow out of the long marrow bone uh, is something that might take you getting used to, this can be extremely appetizing if you roast these on a baking sheet in the oven at about 350. Uh, you gotta watch them maybe half an hour, an hour. It really depends on how thick they've been cut. But roasting these thin little ones can make it very appetizing. And then you'll just scoop it out, put it on toast, sprinkle it with a little sea salt, and it'll be delicious. It really will be. As I shared with you in the video that I made about making chicken bone broth, I like to use a fat separator to separate the fat from the broth and then I can go right to decant it. Now, if you don't have a fat separator, that's fine. All you'll do is strain the broth, which I'll show you what, how we're going to do that in a minute with the cheesecloth and the strainer, and then put it in the refrigerator. The next day, you can remove the uh, beef tallow. It'll be very hard and thick and white. You can remove that, put that aside and save that for other recipes, and then decant your bone broth. So what I'm gonna do is start by taking this bone broth and putting it through the strainer top of my fat separator, and I'm just gonna continue to fill this up until I get right to the top. And then you'll see the fat will float to the top, and then we will uh, strain the broth, and a little bit of fat that remains, I'll decant down into this little bowl here, and I'll show you exactly how I do that. Now I've filled this as much as I can, and I'm hoping that you can see right here is the layer of beef fat, and down below is the beef broth. So what I'm going to do now is prepare my strainer, and I'm going to line it with um, a flour sack towel is what I use, and when, I'm all, when I've got that all ready, I'll bring you back. Now what I've got here is a large measuring cup, and it's glass so that you can see what I'm doing. Normally I'd be putting my strainer over a big stock pot so that I could strain everything in one fell swoop. This I'll have to strain a little, transfer it to a bowl, because it'll start to get filled up very quickly. But I wanted you to see this and make it clear for you, so that's why I'm using the glass measuring cup. Now the first thing that I'll do when I get ready to strain my my uh, bone broth is to use a flour sack towel. Now you can use uh, cheesecloth, but it is a little expensive. Now I know people uh, will wash it out and reuse it, but at some point it will need to be discarded. But if you want it, the good thing about using cheesecloth, if, if you do want to use it, it's a very easy cleanup because if you don't reuse it and rewash it, once you've strained your broth, you can just discard it. That's kind of nice for a very busy household. But what I do is I use these flour sack towels. I've had them forever. They wash up beautifully and they last very well, amazingly. And I will line this and I will get ready 
to decant the broth and I'm going to stop when the fat gets down here and then I'll put that in a separate bowl. But before I do that, I want to show you that if you didn't have a fat separator like this, this is the step where you would simply line your strainer with cheesecloth or with a flour sack towel like this. I start in the corner like this because I'm going to move the flour sack towel around as it gets a little filled with debris and it gets a little more difficult for the stock to strain through. So I just start in one corner and then all you do is you take your bone broth and you would pour it right through. And then you would take your container, whatever you've strained it into, put it in the refrigerator, let it cool, and as I said, the next morning the fat will have hardened. Uh, it, you'll see like a solid white, maybe pale yellow fat. You can lift that off and then you'll be ready to decant your broth. So now I'm going to strain this broth that's in my fat separator. And when I get this right down to the fat, I'm going to stop. So I'm just going to keep letting that go. It's getting closer. I just watch it carefully. You'll see there's going to be a lot of debris. I'll show you that on the, uh, on the flour sack towel. Alrighty, we're very close. It looks like there's just fat in there at that point. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to put that to the side for now. And I'm just going to help this along by moving this around a little. As I said, I'll move it little by little from corner to corner just to make it easier for the broth to strain through. And here I want to show you so you can see. This is why I use a flour sack towel or people would also use cheesecloth because you want to strain out all of those little bits. At least I do. I just think it makes the broth look a lot clearer and more appetizing. So I'm going to continue straining out this broth. First what I'm going to do is just decant this fat right into this little bowl and then I'm going to refill the fat separator with broth and do the same thing all over again. And I'm not going to throw out this fat, I'm going to keep this because beef tallow is wonderful to be used for so many things. It has a very uh, high smoke point which makes it wonderful for frying. Now I want to show you there is a little bit of broth that I did miss, but I'm going to be straining all of this again anyways to get my beef tallow nice and clear and make sure that there's no uh, little bits of debris in that either. And at that point that little extra beef broth that I'm able to strain out I'll just add to my bowl of, uh, of the finished beef broth. Well, I strained all my bone broth through the uh, flour sack towel and I just wanted to show you how it looks. This is all the debris that I was able to get out of the um, broth that I was straining. So as you can see, it's quite significant and it's going to make a difference in making this clearer and more palatable and just generally more appetizing. So I'm going to put that aside and then we'll get ready to decant the bone broth. Oh, and two things that I wanted to share with you before we decant the broth is number one, my flour sack towel. I wanted to address that with you. I'm going to wash that off in my sink and get all of that debris off it and then I'm just going to throw it in with my regular load of dish towels and it'll wash up beautifully and it'll be ready for the next batch of bone broth that I make. So it's, very, uh, it's a very thrifty way to uh, have a cloth that strains your bone broth. Alrighty, well, I wanted to show you this. Look at this magnificent amount of tallow that I got out of this batch of bone broth. Now there's a little bit of broth down the bottom. I already strained this once and I could strain it again, but I noticed that it was really just a lot of debris, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to put this in the refrigerator and I'm going to let this harden and once it's hardened, I'll take the, I'll remove the fat right out and I'll leave that little bit of broth and debris on the bottom. Be a nice little treat for the dog. Now I don't freeze my beef bone broth the way I do my chicken bone broth, which you can watch in my previous video where I made chicken bone broth. But what I do is I put it in a half gallon mason jar, or this is eight cups or half a gallon, because my husband and I drink beef bone broth every morning at breakfast. So we go through it very quickly and I'm making bean beef broth continually. So what I'm going to do is just decant this. I remember we've strained this we've, and I've defatted it and I'm going to put this right in. Now what I wanted to mention was some people do not defat their bone broth and that's fine. They'll 
put it, uh, they'll, they'll strain it at this point, they'll just strain out the debris and whatnot, but they won't defat it. And they'll decant it and let a fat rise to the top. And that's a good thing to do if you like to leave it in your refrigerator longer than a few days because that fat helps seal it and to keep it a little fresher. And then people like to enjoy a little bit of that fat when they heat up their bone broth because it is very nutritious for you. So I'm going to go ahead and continue to decant this and fill this jar and when I'm all done I'll bring you back. Well I've finished decanting all of my beef bone broth into my half gallon jar here and I, this is the eight cup mark right here and I went right up to the rim and so I think I probably got about nine cups of beef bone broth which is just wonderful and smells good and looks delicious and what I'll do now is I'll put, the, this has cooled quite a bit as I've been decanting it, I'm going to put the lid on and I'm going to put this in my refrigerator and then in the morning it's going to be very gelatinous. I know from experience, especially when you use oxtails, you get a very gelatinous broth. And each morning I'll scoop some out, I'll put it into a um, pot on my uh, stove, I'll warm it and my husband and I will be able to have a nice uh, mug of bone broth with our breakfast. For the complete instructions on how to make this beef bone broth, please visit my website marysnest.com. Uh, you can view it online or you can print it out, whatever you want to do. And if you like this video, I hope you'll give me a thumbs up. And if you enjoy learning more about traditional foods cooking, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. And if you do, be sure to click on the notification bell that'll let you know each time I upload a new video. Well, that's all for today, but I hope you enjoyed spending time with me here in my kitchen. I certainly enjoyed having you here. See you next time. Love and God bless.